Hi, you're watching BK Hobby, and in the last part of OpenHab Basics, we talked about sitemaps and how they're used to build user interfaces for your phone or touchpad. This allows you to directly control the items and things in your home automation system, like change the light color or control the audio system. But what if you want something to happen without your intervention? You know, automate your home. Today we're going to start talking about the biggest topic to tackle in the subject of home automation, the actual automation part. This is what we've been working up to in all the videos up to now, and today we'll really just go through an introduction to get you started automating your home with OpenHab. As you have seen by now, there are multiple ways to do pretty much everything in OpenHab. That includes the automation part. There is the current standard of writing rules files. There is JSR223 scripting for those who are more familiar with programming. And there's even an exciting new feature called the Next Generation Rules Engine, which is experimental right now, but when finished, it will allow you to develop automation routines with mostly a point and click interface. This will make automating your smart home much easier. But for now, we'll start with the standard OpenHab rules files, because that is the most commonly used method of automating in OpenHab, and you're more likely to get excellent help from the OpenHab forums if you use the rules DSL programming syntax. As I said, OpenHab rules are still the standard method of automating your OpenHab system. They are very powerful and will be part of OpenHab in one way or another, even when the next generation rules engine is finished. So learning how to use them is a good idea. With rules, you can take any event or action that occurs in your open app system and write a set of steps to perform when that action occurs. So for example, I can write this simple rule, which is triggered when the sun sets, turns on my outdoor lights, and writes a message to the log. This is a very simple rule, but it shows you how to take the things, channels, and items that we've previously learned how to create and connect them together to, to perform a task. It was also the first rule I wrote in my early days with OpenHab, and I haven't thought about my outdoor lights since then. And isn't that the whole point of home automation? This just happens without any intervention from anyone. So let's break this rule syntax down a bit. Check out the purple text going down the column. It reads rule, when, then, end. It basically spells out how the rule works in human readable form, if you read it top to bottom. That is, rule sunset outdoor events will fire when the astro sunset channel triggers start and then it will send an on command to the outdoor lights group, log some info and end. The rule block tells OpenHab we want to create a new rule named sunset outdoor events. Every rule has to have a unique name so OpenHab can distinguish between different rules. But you should also have a descriptive name for each rule so you know what it's doing without having to look at the code inside it. Trust me, with more rules and ones that are more complex than this, it helps just having one line to look at to figure out where you are in the code. Of course, you can also divide your rules into multiple .rules files so you can organize them by function. It's up to you how to organize them, but I've done it by functions like lighting rules, the rules that control my scenes, rules for an effect sequencer I wrote for my holiday lights, rules for the HASP devices that I have installed, or general home rules that don't fit any other category. Okay, so let's talk about the when clause. This statement determines when the rules will execute, and it's also called the rule trigger. There are different types of triggers, depending on what you want to use to fire off your rule. Let's start with the channel trigger. This is a fairly new type of rule trigger, specific to OpenHAP version 2 bindings like Astro or the recently upgraded MQTT binding. You can use this trigger to fire off a rule when an event occurs on one of your things. For example, the Astro binding something has a lot of different channels that will set off a channel trigger on events like Sunrise, Sunset, Civil Dawn, Nautical Dusk, or others. This is super useful for all kinds of scheduling and sun position based events. There's even a moon thing with associated channel triggers for moon phase, moon position, etc. If you want to use those for any rules. 
I'll also mention here that the new MQTT binding, starting with OpenHab version 2.4, also allows you to create trigger channels, so you can set up rules which fire when a particular MQTT topic gets a new message. For example, handling the conversion of a temperature value when a new data point is published to the sensor's temperature topic. The next very useful type of rule trigger is time. Time events are used for scheduling things like turning off lights at midnight, reminding you to take out the trash every Sunday night, or reading a sensor value once a minute. You use a cron expression to define the rule schedule. And you can use a site like this one, cronmaker.com, to come up with a cron expression depending on the schedule you select. System triggers are generally used for startup routines. So for example, one of my system started rules fires every time OpenHab restarts and sets some default values for my internet speed test items so they don't show up in the null state on a GUI. Thing triggers are again an OpenHab 2 addition. I don't really use them in my setup yet, but one possible place they could be used is, for example, with the network binding, where you could check whether your phone thing is online to allow presence detection and set up your lights, scenes, etc. By the way, check out this great article from David at smarthomeblog.net if you want to set up something like this yourself. I'll link to it in the video description below. And finally, the most used, in my experience, rule trigger is the item event trigger. This rule trigger fires whenever an item you define receives a command or an update, depending on what you define. The difference between update and command is subtle, but for example, if you have a temperature sensor that sends a new value every minute to an MQTT topic, the item tied to that topic will receive an update every time the value changes. If you toggle a switch on your sitemap or hat panel, the action will send a command to your switch item. You can also use send command and post update functions in your rules to interact with other items, change their state, and even trigger other rules. A good example of when you'd want to post an update and not send a command is the speed test init rule. When the system starts up, the switch that's used to manually start a new internet speed test may be in a null state, neither on nor off. The speed test init rule is used to set that state to off if it's null. But we don't want to send a command to the switch, so we use the post update function to simply update the status of the switch on the sitemap. You can also see that one of the triggers to the speed test rule is when the speed test rerun switch item receives an on command. That means we've pressed the button on the UI and we want to run the test. This rule will not fire if we simply use a post update function to send an on command to the item. So again, the post update will simply set the state of the switch on the UI. Send command will act as if that switch was pressed. As you could also see from the previous example, we can filter both on an update or command, but also on different states of those updates or commands. For example, this speed test rule used the switch items on command to fire, but you can also trigger a rule if the state of the item simply changes. Like this environmental rule that fires anytime the local temperature or humidity value changes. It's important to note that you can mix and match rule triggers within the when clause. So for example, I can have a rule that runs my internet speed test every hour or whenever I press a button on my user interface that sends a command to the switch item. Finally, let me show you one more possible modification of an item event trigger. This one is even newer as of OpenHab version 2.3 and it is the member of clause. It's used to create rules that need to run when any item within a group satisfies the item trigger. So check this out. I have my color rule that fires every time a member of the LED strips group color items receives an update. I have 15 or so LED strips throughout the house. So anytime I set the color for one of those strips, this rule will fire. This one rule handles the color change for 15 different strips. If not for the member of clause, I'd either have to rewrite this rule 15 times or use a huge or statement to handle every item that could trigger this rule. Okay, so let's look at the actual meat of the rule, the then clause. This is what actually gets done when the rule triggers. You can have real simple or real complex blocks of logic here, depending on what you need the rule to do. You can check the state of items here, use if and else if 
or switch statements to take different paths through your code, and you can send commands or post updates to other items to automate your home. Shown here is another pretty simple but useful rule that will set the heating set point of my thermostat to the proper temperature depending on whether I'm home or away on vacation. I have a vacation mode switch in my user interface that I can manually turn on when we leave the home. When I do that, this rule will automatically set the thermostat heating point to 52 degrees Fahrenheit, keeping my heater off, but also keeping my house warm enough to prevent freezing water pipes in the winter. When we return and set the vacation mode switch to off, the rule will take a different path through the code and set my heater to a higher temperature. Notice I also use a lot of log info statements throughout my code. I use logger statements to not only to keep track of the things that are happening in my home automation system, but also to troubleshoot my rules as I'm writing them. You can put log statements everywhere in your rules code and see exactly what path the system is taking through your rule and help identify any problems with your rule code. We talked about the member of rule trigger in the when clause and how useful it is to perform a rule on multiple items but there are also very useful helper variables in the then clause as well. Triggering item is a variable that holds a reference to the item that triggered your rule, if using an item event rule trigger. You can use this variable in your code to pull things like the name or state of the triggering item. So just to show you again, I use this in my LED strip rules to determine which specific item of the LED strip group fired the rule so that I can set the color on the specific LED strip that I want to change instead of the entire group. Received command holds the state of the command that was issued. Again, this is for those item event triggers where you're triggering the rule when an item receives a command. For example, a Z-Wave switch attached to your OpenApp system. You can use this variable to identify the action that should be performed depending on the specific command. For example, I use the receive command in my monoprice whole house audio amplifier rules to determine whether the command that came into my power switch rule was to turn the amp on or off and send a different string to the amp to perform that action. Previous state holds the state of the item before the rule was triggered. With this variable and the current state, you can determine the direction of change of a sensor's temperature or humidity value and use it, for example, to figure out whether the shower is on in your bathroom. Of course, the OpenHab documentation already has all the info I'm providing here and more. If you need to look up any reference I mentioned in this video, I recommend you store this page in your favorite links. The link is in the video description. And of course, the excellent OpenHab community forums are another place where you can easily find the help you need while you're writing your first, second, tenth, or whatever rule. I use the forums all the time to come up with ideas and to learn how to make my rules better as well. Speaking of ideas and making your rules better, just do a quick search for design pattern in the OpenHab forum and take a look at each of the articles that pop up. These design patterns are thorough and extremely useful examples of how to write rules for specific tasks. You'll find Rich Koshak wrote most of these because Rich is the absolute rules guru on the OpenHab forums and you're very likely to get a response from him if you post a question. The very first design pattern article I recommend reading is Rich's How to Structure a Rule post. This article will explain to you in very detailed terms how and why to write your rules in a specific format. I've also decided to share my actual home automation configuration with you on GitHub. So you can take a look at my rules, see some examples of how I use them to automate things around my house, and maybe even use some of my rules in your own setup. I'll post the link to it in the video description. Okay, we're technically at the end of the OpenHab Basics series, but really this is just the beginning. As I've mentioned before, rules are a huge topic and we've only just scratched the surface. So I'll definitely be making more OpenHab videos about rules, but also other topics. If you notice, we kind of skipped over persistence for example. And persistence is a very important topic as well, especially if you want to do things like charts or restore your lights to the previous state when OpenHab loses power. I will definitely be tackling that topic in one of my upcoming videos, as well as other more advanced topics. In the meantime, you can take a look at some of the other videos I've already created about OpenHab. For example, the scenes and routines video uses some more complex rules to store and restore item states and to create dynamically configurable lighting scenes. So definitely check this one out. 
If you like these videos, hit the thumbs up button and subscribe to my channel if you haven't already. And join our Discord server for some live discussions about this video or other home animation topics. I'm excited about the community we've built there so far and the great new ideas we're sharing. Thanks again for watching and until next time, this is BK Hobby. Thank you.